this week. And uh, again, we want to continue this series on hope, uh, reminding ourselves of the theological virtue, uh, the virtue that is hope. Uh, hope is uh, one of, if not our most important um, tools, uh, dare I say, reservoirs of, uh, of, of strength, of, 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 st of power, of fuel to continue along this way. Uh, hope is uh, um, a, a wonderful, wonderful gift given to us uh, through the grace and the power of God. And so Ephesians chapter 1 uh, is our lectionary passage. Now what's so interesting about the lectionary this week, there were uh, so many passages uh, this week that were talking so much about uh, the sheep and shepherds and, and, and the ways in which uh, the power and the strength of God's direction um, is on display. Um, you know, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, the scripture was talking about uh, the ways in which uh, we are uh, uh, encouraged by the Lord through the Lord's promise that God will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Scripture says, Ezekiel chapter 34, that God will bring them and rescue them and put them in a place uh, where they will have protection and they will uh, feed, be fed on the good pasture. Then you go down to Psalms 100, and we know that passage of Scripture so very well. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all all the earth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I, I almost got stuck in the, in the passage of Matthew verse 25, where it talks a little bit about uh, the sheep and the goats being gathered by the Lord in the end. And I was going to talk about some sheep and some goats and uh, ask you, which one do you uh, describe yourself as? Praise God. But then I got pulled into Ephesians chapter one, verse 15, um, because I did find this passage to be uh, a passage that uh, not only resonated with uh, the theme that we are attempting to preach through this week, but it also uh, reminded me of the power of, of the calling you and I have, um, the calling that is on our lives, the power and the calling that is within not just our grasp, but dare I say has been uh, incarnated within our spirit and our soul. Uh, Ephesians is uh, one of the, the most uh, theologically rich texts we have in the Christian uh, scriptures. Uh, it is uh, thought traditionally to have been written by Paul, but through some of our more uh, recent and modern um, kind of uh, theological tools and, and criticisms, we call that, uh, it is thought to have been written by someone who was a student of Paul or someone who uh, was so familiar with Paul's letters, with Paul's ideas, uh, that uh, as was common during the kind of first century, they had what they called pseudo writers or people who wrote in folks name in order to keep the certain messages or ideas alive with some authority. And so when you break Ephesians down, you know, many people feel like it is a, 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 a series of the greatest hits of Paul's theological offerings. If you're like me, you know, and you're a sports fan and uh, you're, you're like a 49er fan or you're a Laker fan, I, I guess you could use the Raiders, but you have to go all the way back to the 70s or something like that, praise God, where, you know, you just have a series of winning teams and, and then you do like a, 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 a greatest uh, hits or greatest games. Um, or let's say you're a music fan. Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Commission, um, uh, The Winans, uh, uh, Hezekiah Walker, John P. Key, uh, 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 Yolanda Adams, Mary Mary. Over time, their consistency in producing excellence allows them to create a greatest hits album, right? Well, Ephesians could be seen as one of Paul's greatest hits theological treatise. It is a collection of some of the greatest theologically rich ideas of Paul that have been continuously preached and taught on for millennia to help you and I as followers of Jesus in whatever time period or season of life we are enduring be connected to a faith and a way, a way of life a way of being, a way of 
hoping and teaching and, and preaching and, dare I say, forming and discipling people, Ephesians is one such letter. And so we are, are going to spend our time in this passage of Scripture, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, as our lectionary passage. And I'm going to pluck uh, uh, the, the middle part out of this uh, uh, passage to, to kind of sit down in our sermon and preaching. But let's read along a little bit together um, and uh, see what the Word of the Lord uh, says to us as we preach and teach on this uh, theological virtue of hope. Uh, verse number 15 of Ephesians chapter 1, the words of Scripture say this, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Verse 17, and I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. Mm. Uh, at verse 18, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you. What are the riches of God's glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for us who believe according to the working of God's great power? Verse 20, God put the power to work in Christ when God raised Jesus from the dead and seated Jesus at God's right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God has put all things under Jesus' feet and has made Jesus the head over all things for the church, which is God's body, the fullness of God who fills all in all. Oh, the word of God for us, the people of God. Uh, come on, just say thanks be to God in the chat. Just thank the Lord for the word. Thank the Lord for the word. Last week we preached from the topic, I can't take my eyes off you, talking about hope. And today I want to turn that around and say hope can't take its eyes off you. Hope can't take its eyes off you. Hope has his eyes on us, all right? Let's pray, God. I want to thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please let the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy may it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way just say amen everywhere. Amen, amen. Come on, put it in the chat. Hope has its eyes on you tell somebody put somebody's name in there call them out and encourage them today or they may not even be in the chat you may just want to put it out there in the atmosphere you may want to send a message uh, through the spirit all across uh, your block your neighborhood your family tree uh, your circle of influence put somebody's name in and just say hey my friend my brother my sister my loved one hope has its eyes on you you. Now, as we've talked about over the last uh, couple of weeks, hope is more than a uh, political statement that has been used by uh, very uh, uh, loquacious and uh, uh, verbose politicians, um, you know, those who have figured out ways to tap into the religious mores and the cultural cues of uh, so many of us in this country. Uh, it is one of, I think, the greatest uh, challenges of Christian faith, uh, dare I say almost any faith, uh, when faith gets too quickly married with power. When faith can be co-opted and, and, and faith can be uh, used in the, the schemes of, of the powerful and the elite among us, even those individuals 
who may have good intentions. I want you to know that uh, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the holy text and the scriptures should never be used in the service of any particular political project, but they should be used as a litmus test, as a critique as a prism. Uh, I was reading one writer this week that talked about uh, the need for Christian faith to recover its prismatic uh, impact, its kind of filter, uh, its kind of, of, of lens to judge and to clarify the kinds of realities that we are seeing cropping up all around us. Um, it is a critique on faith. It is a critique on the practice and performance of some Christian faith in this world and in this country, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, where we can participate in a faith that has given to us tools to, uh, to, 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 to trim and to bring into subjection some of our worst impulses only to see those impulses uh, mushrooming, even as we participate in that said faith. I was so moved uh, by watching um, this, uh, this, this HBO special uh, based on the ta Coates book called Between the World and Me. And uh, again, just another uh, artistic expression of the literary manners, the literary manner in which uh, the the storytelling of black suffering, of the of the the unique experience of black folk in this country, continue to offer a way forward to those who have an ear. Um, it it continues to be instructive to those who want to be taught. And it continues to be a warning to those who are willing to heed it. Um, but I also was quite uh, uh, taken by the many ways in which we see the kind of post-religious, post-Christian postures that are creeping up in the world because many folks are losing hope. And, and as I uh, recall the initial offering of Brother Coates' book, there was indeed some powerful discussions that were uh, kind of springing up across the country, uh, highlighting this kind of philosophical uh, 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 set of assumptions called Afro-pessimism. Uh, this idea... Uh, two kind of schools of thought, at least, that I've been able to grasp on over the years. Uh, one that just says that the, the life of black folks, of black bodies, of oppressed people who are dark in this country uh, are set up to be persistently uh, 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 fodder for the empire, meaning that our location in this country is so vulnerable that we are left with a existence long assignment or sentence to being fodder, to being um, uh, the material by which violence is perpetrated upon. And then there are those who, who kind of, I think, take some of this uh, even further and, and begin to talk about uh, our lives in this country cannot be free from such a reality, that our lives are extended perpetually from that original uh, sin or wicked act of slavery and genocide and imperialism that has been wrought upon us by the colonizers of Europe and, dare I say, Western um, powers and forces uh, of the last several hundred years. And, and, and so I, I continue to wrestle with these ideas of what does it mean for you and I as a people who are literally the progeny of those who found themselves in such precarious and dire circumstances, but still found the power to pull hope out of despair as a fuel to keep moving forward. I want you to know, child of God, that uh, while it may be a right analysis in the physical that 
there is a seemingly persistent assignment by the powerful among us, by the elite and wealthy among us to hold suffering and oppressed and marginalized groups in a fixed place as it relates to empire or to the powers of this world, I want you to know that even if that may be a right analysis in the physical, we who are Christians, we who follow the ways of Jesus, have another tool at our disposal that we must constantly draw well or strength from the wells of our salvation. I want you to believe and I want you to appreciate that what the gift of this theological virtue brings to us called hope is another set of eyes. It is another prism. It is another paradigm that should exempt you and I, not from the struggle of human suffering, but from the despair and pessimism that would seek to rob you and I, not just of our joy and zest for life, but from the strength needed to persevere through the struggles that are real in this moment in time. Yeah, I, I want you to, to grab this this morning that there is hope for you that is more powerful than the pessimism or despair of your experience. There is hope for you. There is hope within you. There is hope that has been given to you and I as a gift. You ought to just put that in the chat and say, hope has its eyes on me. Hope has its eyes on me. You know, I, 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 I think we must continue to remind ourselves of this truth. Why? Because as we go into another season of COVID where death will be visiting so many of our loved ones here and across the country, where sickness will be so frequently uh, visiting so many of us and where the collateral impact of sickness and death will be concretely felt and ubiquitous among so many of us through the kind of uh, uh, paralysis of our social lives and the, 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 the crumbling of our economic realities. I want you to know that hope still lives within the kind of falling down world around us. Hope is not just something that you and I speak about with uh, a cavalier uh, uh, interposition and, and cavalier kind of offerings. No, hope is as concrete as evil. And I want you to know evil is real today. Somebody say amen. Hope is as real as the, the doubt and hope is as real as the pain. Hope is as real as the challenge and the struggle we are facing because hope is given to you as a gift from God. Hope is one of the three theological virtues, as I mentioned last week, love, faith, and hope. And these theological virtues are supernatural gifts that are given to us that help us live for God in the face of evil and wicked opposition. These theological virtues are planted within the life of every believer, of every Christ follower. You may not have even known that this is inside of you, but I want you to know you got love in you that God put there that can't no experience snuff out. You have faith that lives inside of you that can't no tragedy silence. And you have hope inside of you, child of God, that is eternal in its form because it emanates and generates from the uncreated one who has given it to you as a down payment. Lord, help me. It's a down payment for what you and I will need when we go through our expected trials. You ought to just say, I got a down payment of hope inside of me. I got a down payment of hope inside of me. And that is why these, these, these 
these words we've read today are so important for us because they give to you and I a certain kind of experience or dare I say a, a definition, a, 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 a expression, a, 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 a explanation. That's the word I'm looking for. It gives to you and I an explanation and a process for how we are to ensure reminding ourselves every day, every moment, that hope, the real hope, the hope that is concrete, has its eyes on you. In the biblical text, we see that the, the opening words of this passage of scripture uh, that is being written to the church in Ephesus as a summary of Paul's greatest messages and teachings and, 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 and writings to a church living in one of the most diverse cities in the Roman Empire. They are enduring persecution and trials. And yet Paul says, I want you to know that the love you have towards the saints is so known that I've heard of it. Child of God, can your love be so concrete and so well known that it precedes your arrival to any circumstance or situation. I know it's hard to love some folk right along through here. I know it's hard to show that love to folk. I know for some of us that love is strained. It is strained in our relationships because of the politics, because of this virus, because of our economy, because of our experiences. Some of us are in such depths of grief that our love is only demonstrated through the conflicts that we share one with another because we lack the tools to be able to actually process the grief and the anger and the fear in ways that surface the tenderness and the healing of love. I want you to know, child of God, that there is a gift of love, agape, that is buried within your soul. It is buried within your spirit. And when cultivated through the practices of faith, you can see the fruit of love in such a way that it is manifest even to those who are not looking for it. I don't know if you ever been shopping and you went in there looking for one thing, but the, the display of something else was so compelling that it made you want to leave the store with that thing versus the thing you showed up with. Oh, uh, my, one of my, my good friends and comrades and uh, 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 Alvin Herring, he says, if you show up with hope, people will hand you their hope hopelessness. And I want you to know if you show up with love, people will hand you their despair and their hatred and their malice. But child of God, you must cultivate that kind of love for self and for others. The text goes on to say in verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. Now, we're getting into the meat of the sermon here, and I want you to think for a few moments about a couple of the, of the, of the points that we're going to raise. First thing, I, I want you to know, child of God, that the hope that is within us, the hope that keeps focusing and compelling and beckoning us, must be revealed to us through the light and the revelation of God's activity in our lives. Verse 17 says it so powerfully that you and I, through the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we come to know Jesus. Child of God, I want you to understand that your life's journey is one of coming to know him. You and I are not a people who at the first uh, sinner's prayer or the first uh, real commitment to walk with God have received all of the information we need in order to be convinced of God's great love and hope within us. But I love the kind of spiritual formation that is gestured in this passage that reminds you and I that I am a piece of work in progress, that you are a work in progress, that we are are constantly being formed after the image of God and as we live child of God you come to know him 
Who do you, do you, do you, do you understand? Can you appreciate the many experiences in your life that are teaching you things about God you did not know before you went through them? Can you look in, in, in the rear view mirror of your life and, and just think about the ways that God revealed God's self to you, that God demonstrated God's hope to you, that God turned a light on in your life. That's the first point that I want you to appreciate, child of God, that in our journey, hope helps us to turn on the light, that there is a light that must shine in your heart and in your mind that helps us to become enlightened, helps us to be sure of the things that require uh, a certain kind of revealing. Now, I am finding in life, I'm about to get a little honest in here, that coming to enlightenment is a journey that often is more painful than pleasurable. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, sometimes our ignorance is so bliss that we'd rather live in a house of lies than build a refuge of truth. But I want you to know that ignorance, self-deception, dare I say, can never hold the fullness of your possibility. There are so many things that enlightenment must do for you and I, and I just want to lift up a couple of them, given the, the circumstances that so many of us are dealing with. The first is self-deception. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says it like this, they who believe they are standing, be careful lest you fall. There's a lot of self-deception in the world today. There's a lot of self-deluding in the world today. There's a lot of us who love to believe our own half-baked thoughts. And I want you, child of God, to appreciate that self-deception is a form of idolatry. Hope cannot be sustained by a lie. Because the lie does not have the depth, it does not have the shelf life of the truth that is needed to draw strength and power through the difficulty of the season we are enduring. This is why these, these, these so very uh, diabolical efforts to undermine this most recent election with lies is so mind numbing to many of us because many of us who have been enlightened by truth know that the lies have a shelf life. Whoo, Lord, help me today. And, and I want you to know it's a terrible thing to believe your own lies <laughs> because there are lots of people around you who can see that that lie has a shelf life. You are building your life on something that on January 20th will not be true. What kind of foolishness have you and I bought into beyond the political nature, but in our own lives where we believe half truths so we can hold on to self-deception? Self-deception robs you and I of the truth, even if it's an ugly truth. And an ugly truth has the power to help give you direction. And I want you to know, child of God, that more than anything in this season, we must avoid self-deception. Don't believe that just because you're standing strong today means that you are not susceptible to the deceptions that will bring you low to the ground tomorrow. Enlightenment then helps you and I stay open to the truth. One of the other things that we must be enlightened about in this season is the, the, the lies, the mendacity of the wicked. I've mentioned it a little bit already, but I thought it'd be important to read Jeremiah 16. Uh, Jeremiah 20, uh, 16, verse 22, it says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, for they are deluding you. 
They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise the word of God, it shall be well with you. And to all who stubbornly follow their own stubborn hearts, they say no calamity shall come upon you. But when you are enlightened, child of God, you must be like these prophets who can stand as the prophet continues to say in the counsel of the Lord so you can see and hear the word. So you can be one of these people who can proclaim in ways that keep people from falling into deceptions of the wicked. What is at stake when we are not enlightened and caught in the lies of the manipulators around us? Then we put ourselves at risk which is kind of what's been happening in our larger culture. We find that, unfortunately, uh, people still think the virus, coronavirus is not real. Uh, the, the, the orders that have come down. There were folks down in Southern California protesting orders meant to save their lives. Why? Because they have been caught up in the mendacity and the lies of the wicked, and they have not yet been enlightened. I want you to ask yourself, are you caught in a web or a scheme of the wicked? Beyond the coronavirus, beyond the political spaces, what lies have been told to you about your own value and your own worth? What lies have been told to you about the relationships that you are in? What lies have been told to you about the possibilities that are in front of you who believe? What lies have been told to you that cause you to resist the truth that cultivates hope? Child of God, I want you to be enlightened about the purposes and the plans of God in your life. I want you to be enlightened about the, 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 the kind of predestined works and paths that God has for you. Paths that are a good uh, work. Paths that lead to a pleasurable destination. I want you to be enlightened about the ways in which God sits with us in our despair and difficulties. The way that God wipes the tears from our eyes. The way that God sustains us. I want you and I to be enlightened. And then as we keep reading the text says something so powerful that I love and I appreciate. It says that I want you child of God to be mindful of the hope to which God has called you. Whew. When I first read this verse, I, I began to think to myself, Lord, am I aware of how hope is calling me? That hope is calling me. You and I have been called to a hope that has been calling out to us. You and I have been called to a hope that is not just uh, uh, outside of us, but that is within us. The hope of salvation, the hope of better, the hope of healing. Hope is the seed that when watered will force its way into every space of your life. Uh, the, the, the best example I can use about this in my current experience was this week we were having a challenge with our plumbing and 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 the 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 the, the all of the pipes in our in our house were were backed up for some reason and we had called out uh, our plumber to come and 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 clear it out every few weeks and and so finally uh, the the plumber came and said I have to put a camera down this pipe because something is blocking it. So yesterday uh, they, they came out and, and for the whole day they had to dig six, seven, eight feet into the ground to get to the pipe that continued to be obstructed. And when they pulled the pipe out of the ground, a whole tree trunk had grown inside the pipe and was obstructing the water uh, from actually flowing through the pipe and caused the pipe to burst. They pulled the pipe out of the ground and sat it there uh, for me to look at it. I just began to think about how intrusive 
Lord have mercy. That tree's trunk was under the ground, invading places it had no business being. Well, I want you to know that's what hope is. Hope is a force of God's divine will that continues to invade parts of your life that you did not ask for it to show up in. Hope is that which continues if watered and if cultivated, it can break through the solid walls and the pipes and, and the obstructions that you think have been built to keep you out of a place of, 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 of depression or hopelessness. I want you to know hope has the ability to navigate its way through all of these obstructions. Hope keeps looking for you. Hope is like that bloodhound for your soul uh, that keeps sniffing out the scents, the S-C-E-N-T-S, the, the smells that remind you where God is. Hope goes through the course of your life and it finds God in the middle of your despair and makes God known to you. I hope you appreciate the power of this kind of hope as we go through these challenging seasons because hope is intended to, to reveal God's presence to you in spite of your circumstance. Hope is intended to find God when you can't see God. Hope is intended to bring the life out of the death-filled situations. Hope is the shorthand for the process that is always at work in us to turn death into resurrection, to turn uh, despair into the possibilities, to turn weakness into strength. And I want you to know that there is a hope that lays and lies within you and I. That hope keeps you and I chasing then, as the scripture says, an inheritance that has been given to you and I by the power at work in God through Christ Jesus. And that's my last point that I want to lift up to you today, that we are a people who have hope that is within us that serves as the catalyzer to keep chasing the inheritance of the righteous, the inheritance of the power that God has placed within you. I want you to know that there is an inheritance, meaning that there is a, a will, if you will. There is a, a, a ironclad covenant that has been made by God with the faithful, with the believer, with the one who identifies with the life of Jesus, the Jesus who was buried in a grave due to the effects of death. But the strength of God was able to take the worst that happened to Jesus and turn it into the greatest expression of victory in the history of the world. Why is that important? Because you and I are finding ourselves knocking at death's door. We are finding ourselves continuously confronted with despair, with wickedness, with evil, with the plans of the, the wicked around us. And yet in the midst of all of these manifestations, God continues to give you and I reminders that hope that the inheritance of the righteous is within us. I want you to now tap into that hope. I want you to lean into that hope. I want you to pursue that hope, to cultivate that hope, that hope that was God's demonstration to the world by raising Jesus from the dead is now the hope that Christ uses in us to listen, to help be the demonstration of God's activity to those around us. What does that mean? That means that as you go through trial, as you endure hardship, as we press through this season of difficulty, the hope that lies within is fixed on our journey in such a way that it continues to invade 
every experience of our lives. Hope finds God in our mourning. Hope finds God in our sickness. Hope finds God in our betrayals. Hope finds God in our disappointments. Why? Because God is always there. Oftentimes, God's presence is obstructed from our view. This is the, the value of hope. Hope finds God when we cannot see God. And it is in that finding of God, that process of knowing, coming to know, coming to believe, coming to be transformed, that we can turn all these things that we are struggling to understand, struggling to endure, it becomes fuel. Fuel for faith, fuel for love, fuel for hope. Let's take a few moments now and just ask God then, Lord, help me to see you. Help me to find you. Help me to be reminded that you have not forgotten about me, about us, about our condition. God, we ask you, even in this moment today, this moment, Lord God, where it's clear that for some of us, we need to be enlightened. We need a revelation. We need a reminder. We need to be reminded, God, that self-deception, the lies of the wicked, are not more powerful then the strength of your will, the power and the presence of your will. I pray, God, that every person under the sound of my voice today, Lord, will ask and experience enlightenment today. I pray, God, that the enlightenment that we need, Lord, will remind us that there is indeed a light that you seek to shine, that you have placed within us. Lord, a light that when turned on, hope begins to appear. I pray, God, that even in the midst of this season where the ubiquitous nature of death and evil and wickedness and sickness and struggle and transition, Lord God, are felt among us, I pray that hope, Lord, will be as concrete for us. I pray, God, that through the power of our disciplines and the, the practices of our, 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 our faith, Lord God, we will be able to locate the hope that is as concretely present as the despair. And I pray, God, that we will pursue the inheritance, the privileges, Lord God, of being in connection and relationship with you. I pray, God, that this inheritance, Lord God, will always remind us that we have more than enough. We have more than enough for the season that is upon us and the seasons that are to come. May we pursue, may we cherish, may we lean into this inheritance. And God, may we be reminded that hope has its eyes on us. Hope is within us. It is never beyond our reach or our grasp but it is constantly working to bring life to bring strength to bring possibility if you're here today and you don't know Jesus so you're struggling with the faith one of these virtues the faith that that is the bedrock for that hope and love needed come on I dare you to take a few moments and just acknowledge and admit Lord my my faith is is weak my faith is non-existent my faith is strained so God I ask you right now Lord to give me faith the kind of faith that believes even in the midst of obvious contradictory evidence give me the faith to know 
God, that there is a work and a plan that is for our good and not our destruction. Give me, God, faith to know, Lord, that there is, Lord God, a future to create that hope will fuel us toward. And so, God, I pray pessimism will not be our lot. I pray, Lord God, despair will not be our lot. We will shed tears. We will mourn. We will cry. We will feel the gamut of human emotions. And we will even endure some of the experiences we never imagined. But God, may hope be the bloodhound that finds you in our soul. God, may hope be on the lookout. May it be, Lord, feeling and sensing and smelling your presence and may it lead us to that path so we can indeed experience that which you have for us. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. May the people of the way say amen. Amen. Hope, hope, hope has its eyes on us.